All right, it's been a while since I spoke to an audience like this. I hope it's uh, kind of like riding a bicycle. We'll figure out, I guess, in a second. Um, so, you know, I, I don't think you're a vendor uh, or a cool vendor if you're not talking about AI in some way. And obviously, my background is in the open source community. I've been very privileged to have an opportunity to be a part of some really substantial kind of open source efforts like Kubernetes and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And I thought I'd spend some time just talking about the intersection of open source communities, AI, and sustainability and safety. But before I do that, um, I have a really important question for you. Have you ever wondered what the cross between a hedgehog and a dashunt would look like? Now, we live in this amazing time because with generative AI, you can actually answer that question. Like historically, to get to this point, you'd have to imbibe an inordinate number of psychedelics, and then you could figure this out. But we do live in this new world where this kind of thing is possible. And obviously, AI is starting to show up in almost every facet of, of the technology that we consume. But there's nowhere where it's actually generating quite as much value, I don't think, as in the code generation space. Um, turns out that this is an actual practical use case that is generating a tremendous amount of value out there in the real world right now. And if you go to speak to our friends at GitHub, they'll tell you some statistics that I think kind of really embody this. 41% of code right now is AI generated, according to them. Uh, AI developers are 55% you know, faster. 92% of developers out there are using AI tools. Now, obviously, this is an open source summit. And when you really think about it, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of value here. And then using generative AI, we are able to implement logic, obviously. We're able to start selecting OS dependencies and get directed in the right place to kind of really drive the reuse. And we have the opportunity to add entirely new capabilities to the projects. Now, it's also worth recognizing that like 90% of the code that's being shipped out there uh, is actually just reconstitution of open source. It's a set of dependencies repackaged. If you look at ChatGPT, which is taking the world by storm, I always like to point out, like behind the scenes, that's Linux and Kubernetes and PyTorch and TensorFlow and Python. And like the, the totality of open source is really creating so much value in the world. So when you look at generative AI and generative code, it's natural to look at the, the part of the iceberg that's under the water, which is what is the impact this is going to have on our OS's communities and on our OS community productivity? Now, turns out uh, there's some bad people out there, and they have access to the same tools that, that we do. So at a time when their attention is turning to our supply chains as a point of exploitation. And you've probably seen this slide I would imagine two dozen times, or this, 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 this XKCD cartoon two dozen times in the last couple of weeks, as a result of the XC vulnerability. You know, we are definitely in a world now where the attention of hostile actors is turning to open source communities. We're in a world now where um, open source communities have access to new quality tools that's gonna change the dynamics. But we're also in a world where those same hostile actors have access to tools that are gonna enable them to do some new things. And this is gonna have some cascading implications, and I wanna talk about those just for a minute, and then talk about some of the things that we can be doing as a community to make progress in this space. So let's start with the good. Um, more productive maintainers. So I, I, I don't know, show of hands, like how many of you think you know, maintaining an open source project is, is a grind? Like, I'm surprised there's not more hands, because like, based on my experience with individuals, there's a lot of activity associated with open source maintenance that isn't comfortable, it isn't easy. Uh, it's repetitious work, it's hard work, it's, it's sometimes mind-numbing work. And having access to these tools is going to make things better. We also have access to um, you know, new technologies that are gonna drive uh, things like you know, code reviews and improve you know, sort of throughput productivity for our open source organizations. We have access to new security tools that are also gonna improve our posture. So there's, there's definitely a lot of good to be said for this. And if you think about 90% of the code that's being shipped is out there, developers are more productive. Overwhelmingly, we should feel really upbeat about it. But there's also some bad associated with uh, the introduction of uh, AI and generative AI into these open source communities. You know, first and foremost, um, obviously, if you're losing something like ChatGPT, you might say, hey, write me a blah, and it will produce a you know, fully formed uh, set of capabilities. But it's important to recognize that that model was trained in, I think it was January 2022. And the world's moved on since January 2022. So there's always this sort of opportunity for these generative AIs to introduce things like stale dependencies. We're also starting to see some trends in the community that tend to indicate that hostile actors are taking advantage of these tools. So one of the things that my little company is doing is 
uh, we watch open source repos. So we sort of register with things like NPM. We watch every package that comes through. We try to rate that package, get a sense of whether it's good or bad. And then if we see something that we don't think is, is, uh, is, it's, is, not, is not above board, we, we kind of work to try to remediate it. The volume of hostile packages that are being published to our repos has just gone through the roof. It's unbelievable how much badness is being pushed out there. I don't have proof of this, but I'm reasonably confident that generative AI is behind a lot of this, that a lot of the hostile actors are starting to use these tools to generate variations on packages. And that's gonna put a lot of pressure on us uh, and create some interesting situations. And we haven't seen these types of exploits yet, but it's reasonable to assume that these hostile actors are also gonna be generating projects that are used to retrain, to kind of actually drive um, vulnerability insertion, to do um, uh, some relatively nefarious things that are gonna to continue to put pressure on our communities. And so when we step back and look at this, um, there is going to be increasing pressure on our communities. And this is something that I, I want to really take a few moments to kind of you know, think through. You know, first and foremost, uh, you know, we are bringing AI and, and generative AI capabilities you know, into the projects that we rely on every day. And we have relatively few controls, so we're, we're likely to see supply chain uh, exploitation. We're likely to see some really interesting and novel uh, capabilities, or uh, negative capabilities being used to, to bring those into our, our projects. But more importantly, we're also at this moment, this kind of crucial moment, where we have our communities, we have our open source um, capabilities that are so central to the human condition and, and driving innovation. And, and what's happening out there is just gonna continue to put even more pressure on it. So if you look at something like the XC vulnerability, and you look at that like one maintainer in Nebraska that's trying to hold this all together, and you now have um, a situation where you know, empowered uh, sort of hostile actors are gonna start showing up and trying to engage, you can see where this is gonna go. It's gonna become problematic over time. And it has had the potential to fundamentally undermine the trust that we've all built in open source and, and undermine a lot of what's you know, really driven the success of our communities. So we really do need to think about this a little bit and, and take some time as a community to be measured in, in how we look at the, the path ahead. And so some things that I think about a lot and I kind of want to draw your attention to is like, as always as, main, as, as producers, um, we are going to have to put more time and effort into showing the people that are using our work, you know, how we got there. So, We've seen things like um, SigStore emerging as a way to establish the deterministic provenance of a piece of software. And that's something that I think we really should be putting our attention into um, as an organization. Because you know, at the end of the day, when you have these folks that are publishing reams of bad packages, being able to point to the package that you actually generated, that your community was standing behind, and making sure that it stands out in the, in the mess is gonna be really important. You need to be ready to show your work. So we start looking at things like S-bombs, which was a result of the, um, of the solar winds incident. You know, obviously the administration got involved, they started to kind of drive by fiat the need to kind of have this demonstration of work. I think we can do better as a community. The S-bomb's a nice start, but we have an opportunity to actually create operational value around these things, and that's something that we will need to look at and invest in. And then, you know, shameless plug for my company, look for tools that uh, enable you to run security re reconciliation loops against your project, against your code in real time to look out for these types of things. And I'll talk about that in a second from the, uh, the stack lock angle. Now, it turns out open source is both you know, production and consumption. There's, there's two sides to the equation. On the consumption side of the house, you know, I think we really need to put a human in the loop. It's gonna be incredibly important for the next little while to make sure that we are actively scrutinizing the dependencies that we take. And you know, it's interesting, when I, when I look at the, um, when I look at the characteristics of a well-run uh, open source uh, uh, entity or a well-run open source community, there's a lot of scrutiny and thought that goes into things like dependency management and scrutinizing the set of dependencies. There's a lot of thought that goes into code reviews. And for the time being, you know, it's gonna be tempting for us to kind of start to rely on a lot of these new technologies, but we have to recognize that these technologies are new, they're nascent, and they're also vulnerable in, in some ways. So we just cannot afford not to have humans in the loop. You know, a, a call out to, to organizations as we look at things like um, the challenges of, of open source maintenance is to really vote with your wallet. Um, you know, I implore organizations that are making procurement decisions to look at the contributions that vendors are making back to communities. And there's some vendors out there that are, are really walking the walk and talking the talk, and we should reward them by procuring their products and actually making that part of the procurement decision. 
Because, you know, as we're about to see with, with this kind of XC vulnerability and, and the sort of the natural backlash of, of that, it, it is going to generate a lot of heat. It's going to generate a lot of pressure. Communities are going to need our support. And then finally, um, I think we really need a uh, grassroots model to map open source community efforts and to support smart decision making. Jim said this yesterday. I think it's been a pretty consistent theme over the last little while. Open source isn't just about projects. Open source isn't just about technology. Open source is also about people, how people interact together to produce value, how they work together to solve problems. And we need to start factoring that into our decision making. We need to start factoring that into how we're thinking about the projects that we consume. You know, when we're looking at a piece of technology and trying to make the decision between three or four different uh, factors, we, we really need to start considering the sustainability and the human components of this. So this is my second shameless plug for the day. I'll talk about this as well, uh, you know, in terms of work that we've been doing through the lens of community to support this. And then finally, as generative AI consumers, it's worth recognizing that there is a lot of work to do around provenance and attestation. You know, you think it's crazy in the open source ecosystem right now with you know, reuse and repackaging and, and redistribution of open source content. The AI and generative AI model ecosystem is incredibly wild. Like it's just, there's so much entropy, there's so much heat, there's so little structure. And so that's something that we are as a community gonna to have to rally around and think about. So with that, I'd like to kind of, you know, just take a moment to introduce some of the stuff that we've been working on as a little uh, startup in this ecosystem to address some of these. So my company, Stacklock, is a software supply chain security company. And we've been around for about a year. And we build open source tools to secure software delivery. So we're really about helping open source communities build software more sustainably and securely. And then we're about helping other organizations take that software and consume it in a sustainable way. And so we just shipped two things which I think are gonna be you know, quite exciting. And we would love to get your feedback on. Both of these are available, uh, you know, either open source or free to use uh, hosted SaaS versions. They will always be free to open source communities. So we're here to support communities. And um, I want to kind of draw your attention to them. The first is what we call an open source software trust graph. So what we're looking to do here is, when you think about this landscape of packages, when you think about this landscape of repositories, when you think about this landscape of, of individual contributors, we've applied a statistical approach to understanding what looks good and what looks bad in absence of other information. So we just look at like a gazillion packages that are good, we look at as many bad packages as we can, and we try to infer what good and bad looks like. And then what we've done is we've built a model that takes those packages and looks at who's working on them. So if someone shows up and they're relatively unknown and they start working on a new, on a package that has a strong reputation, like a, a Kubernetes or something like that, it will tend to kind of pull up their rankings, pull up their score, uh, because they've now been seen to work in, a, in an environment. So it's kind of a proof of diligence type model. And then when they show up on another project, that will then kind of you know, bring that credibility to, to that other project. So we've built out this graph, we've published a paper, we'd love to get your input on it. It's very nascent, we're releasing it as a closed beta because you can imagine there's a little bit of sensitivity about this type of, of, of analysis and we wanna make sure we get it right and we don't have any secondary effects. But we do invite you to kind of engage with us and, and take a look at it. And then the second thing that we've been working on is you know, it's, it's not enough to just have that signal intelligence. It's not enough to just have you know, a view of, oh, like, hey, this package actually has a sustainable and healthy community behind it, or hey, this package is perhaps uh, you know, produced by you know, someone nefarious because we just haven't seen anything they've ever done before. We also need to have a way to integrate those capabilities into projects that people are you know, sort of operating on a day-to-day -day basis. So make it a natural part of their workflow. Integrate it into tools that are as far left as possible. Because the last thing you want to do as an open source maintainer or as a, as a developer in any, in any context is produce something, invest in it, solidify it, bake it, ship it, and then discover that there's something wrong with it, right? So you really want to uh, insert yourself as, as far left as possible. So into the IDE extension, into the, um, the, the kind of Git workflow, uh, we've provided the ability to start asserting policies just using open source technology. So here's a way to say, I want all of my open source dependencies to look like this. If something happens, generate a reconciliation loop to kind of you know, drive it to, to, to closure. And so that's the second thing that we're uh, announcing as, as an organization. So I implore you to you know, take a look at this and, um, and you know, definitely you know, think about these, these kind of implications from an open source perspective. Like, I truly believe that open source is one of, the, like the open source portfolio is one of the great treasures of humanity. It stands behind pretty much every substantial innovation that we've, we've, we've generated to date. 
And so we owe it to our communities and we owe it to ourselves to make sure that as this ecosystem changes, as new disruptive tools are approaching, as, as hostile actors are operating in new ways, we're positioned to navigate this in a, in a mature and sustainable way. So thank you so much and uh, have a great uh, rest of the day.